This video is brought to you by Atzmut.org, presented by Rabbi Alon Anava. If you would like to dedicate a class in honor of someone, please contact us via our website at www.atzmut.org. Please subscribe to this channel to be notified about new videos. And tonight we actually we're going to talk about three very important things. First of all, we're in a very special night. This is Erev Rosh Chodesh Sivan. So that in itself is a very auspicious time. And I want to talk about today about three th major things. The power and the importance of the day of Rosh Chodesh. A little bit about the holiday of Shavuot and the giving of the Torah. And also this night is a very auspicious time to read a special prayer that is called Filat Abanim. The prayer is for the kids. Bezat Hashem, if whoever who didn't read it already can still read it. But, uh, excuse me? Anything? There's no uh, time. It's better to read it Erev Rosh Chodesh, right before the sun goes down. But I'm going to go a little bit about that and the connection to Shavuot and the connection to Rosh Chodesh and then you'll see, technically you can read it almost any time you want. It's just auspicious times to read it. Is it only for Shavuot? No. No, that prayer? Yeah. No. The prayer is you can read every day. Every day. Some sages say you should memorize the prayer mm -hmm. and say it every day. But the rabbi who, who, who is known as the Holy Shala, the Shala is the acronym, Shin Lamed Hei. His name is Yeshaya, Halevi Horovitz. The very special rabbi was born in Prague about 450 years ago, 450 to 500 years ago, from a very, very special family, Horowitz. Up until today, there's many disciples all over the world. His father was a great rabbi. His father was a Talmud of the Rama. And he was right away known from his childhood to be something very, very special. Very early age, he already became a, a Av Bedin, a head of a, a, a Jewish court. And he was a Av Bedin in many different countries. And his dream was to go to Eretz Israel, and he did it. And in those days, they had to go, imagine Europe, they had to go through Turkey from Syria or Lebanon down into Israel and uh, he was he stopped in Syria in Khaleb where he was greeted in great honor and on the way he was actually arrested along with another 15 rabbis I don't know 15 maybe he was the 15th but there were about 15 rabbis that got arrested and they were tortured and they gave they gave them hell but Baruch Hashem he finally made it and he made it to Eretz Israel and he's buried now in Tveria, right next to the Rambam. There's a shul, the Beknesset of the, of the Shala. That's, that shul was there 800 years before he came there. And the second that he came there and he started praying there, they said, okay, that's the shul of the Shala Kadosh. In Tveria. So, and the thing is that the acronym that he got, Shala, is because he wrote a very special book, Shnei Luchot Habrit. And that's the acronym of Shnei Luchot Habrit, Shala Kadosh. He's a very great Mekubal, very, very special rabbi. So he uh, compiled this prayer. Now, there's actually a contradiction. Some people say that he compiled it himself. Some people say that he got it as a Mesorah from previous rabbis. Nobody really knows. But either way, it doesn't matter. A prayer for parents to read over, for the, over the children. And, you know, we all know, I'm sure all of you, if not some of you, are parents. You only want for your kids to be healthy and good kids. And anyone that will ask him about the kids, no, just, just that they'll be healthy, uh, most important, healthy. And then that they should be good kids and they should be... Uh, 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 have a lot of derech eretz and they should learn Torah. You, every parent wants for their kids the best. And he explains that in order for us to get that best for our kids, we must pray for them. And not only just saying, you know, once a year to Hashem, you know, I want my kids to be okay. 
he, you asked before if we can read it, when should we read it? No, Some Chachamim say, re memorize it and say it every day. Yeah. Every day. Now, okay, nobody will say it every day. But he, some Chachamim say, yeah, memorize it. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing in our life is our kids. More than the Parnasa, more than, than anything, is our health and, our, and the, and the well-being of our kids. In the physical realm, one wants the kids to be healthy and good because that's the nachat you get, that's the joy you get. If chas v'shalom a parent sees a child sick, there's no greater sorrow to, 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 for a parent. It even says that Hashem Barachem lo aleinu, if a person, a, a parent, loses a, a child, he has to bury a child in his lifetime, then this person is muvtach lo ganeden, he's promised to be in ganeden. Because the Yesurim, the suffering of going by losing a child in this world, is nothing greater than that. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, she'akol niya v'doro. So nothing, we don't want more. Right now we have it here. If you don't want to say it now, just go on the internet, just do Tfilat Abanim or Shalah Kadosh. It comes right away. I have it also on my website in English and in Hebrew. If you want later, I'll give you all the, the, the link. But even now, you just go to Google and do it, Filata Banim, or the prayers for son by the Shalak Kadosh. You'll, you'll find numerous copies of it. So as I was saying, a parent doesn't want more for his child, just for the child to be healthy and behave well and to, 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 to be a good child. So the Holy Shalah instead of the prayer to say for the parents to pray on the kids, he said it's best to read it on Erev Rosh Chodesh. Every Erev Rosh Chodesh, once a month. But the most auspicious time to read it is Dafka on Erev Rosh Chodesh Sivan, which is this evening tonight. One of the reasons why this is such an auspicious time to dafka pray on our kids, which if you ask my recommendation, pray for your kids every day. This is not a long prayer. This takes maybe three minutes to say. If you care about your kids, then you pray every day. But if you can do it every day, then do it every Rosh Chodesh. And if you can do it every Rosh Chodesh, then do it on Erev Rosh Chodesh Sivan. One of the reasons why it's auspicious time to do it on Erev Rosh Chodesh Sivan is because when Hashem gave the Torah to the Bnei Israel in the desert, which we're going to talk about it very soon, he asked for guarantors. The same way you go now to a bank and you want to get a mortgage or you want to get a loan, if you don't have good credit, they ask for guarantors. So Hashem said, before I'm giving you this precious gift, I need guarantors that you're not going to waste this precious gift. So the Jews answered, we're going to give you our kids as guarantors meaning that they're going to continue learning your Torah and following your path and doing the mitzvot and our kids are going to be our guarantors. So the whole month of Sivan... Guarantors, the cinnamon to it? What is cinnamon? Guarantors are Arevim. Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted from Bnei Israel Arevim, guarantors. Why should I give you this patanana? Why should I give you this present, this Torah? Mm -hmm. So Bnei Israel said, we're going to give you our kids as guarantors. And we're going to teach our kids to go on the path of Torah. We're going to teach our kids to do mitzvot. We're going to teach our kids about this great revelation that we saw. Because in essence, when you think of it, every prayer, every, every little thing that we do, we constantly mention the leaving Mitzrayim, Yitziat Mitzrayim, and we constantly repeat the whole Mama Adar Sinai, the whole time that we got the Torah. There's a great question that people say, how do you know that it's all true? How do you know? So the easiest way to explain it is the same way that in the, in the physical realm, in this country, everybody pr celebrates once a year on 4th of July the independence of this country. One can ask the same thing, how do, you know, how do you know it's true? 
How do you know that this is the day that this country got this independence? Oh, because we're celebrating it already from generation to generation. And my father told me that his father told me that his father told him, etc., etc., going back 400 years, that on this day, this country got this independence. So up until today, we're celebrating it. So we can answer the same thing. Yeah, we did the same thing. My great, 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 great grandfather was in Matan Torah. He saw the entire thing and he told it to all the generations. And that's their fault. We know it's true. And we celebrate this day every year. And we're going to celebrate this day in a week. So this night is such an auspicious time to say this bracha, this prayer, because we offered our kids in the Matan Torah, at the time when we got the Torah, we offered our kids as guarantors. So since we don't want to be liable, if I now bring guarantors to get a mortgage, and if I'm not going to pay my payments, they're going to go to the guarantors. So if I'm not going to be following the Torah and the mitzvot, Hashem is going to go to my kids. And if my kids don't keep Torah and mitzvot, I'm going to have a problem. Because I'm signed on a deal. So I have also an obligation here to bring my kids up in the path of Torah and the path of mitzvot and to teach them. But everything in this world needs Hashem's help. Nothing in this world can happen without Hashem intervening. Chachamim, our sages, teach us that even if Hashem would not help us, we won't be able to fight our Yetzirah. We constantly have to pray for Hashem for everything. If you look in the Tfilat Shemona Yisra, in the prayer of Shemona Yisra that we do every day, all the prayers, we're asking Hashem for physical things and helping us to open our hearts to His Torah, to make us more uh, uh, easy to observe the Torah. So we have to pray for everything, mainly for our kids' health, for our kids' derech eretz, for their love to the Torah, for their love to Hashem. And this is the auspicious night that you can read it. You can read it any day. There's no prohibition to read it any day. If you have the, the free extra five minutes, then read it every day. Nine. You can't. Excuse me? Nine. There's no there's no time to no, no there's not an auspicious not necessarily a time where to read it. You can read it in the morning, in the night, you can read it on Shabbat, you can read it anytime you want. Because we have a, a bad habit of not sticking to things on a regular basis then we instead it once a year it's an auspicious time the thing is that why do we want to do it on an auspicious time and not on an irregular day because i gave the example last class when i was here that every time there's a holiday in this country there's sales there's memorial day 80 percent sale independence day 90 percent sale veterans day 60 percent sale why because it's an auspicious time to make a sale so the same way that this country in the physical realm, they find a special day to give a sale that everybody runs to the department stores to buy everything for 50% off. So tonight is an auspicious time, what's called an etratzon, that it's a right time that our prayers can be heard. And this is where I want to talk a little bit about Rosh Chodesh. Before I start talking about Rosh Chodesh, we're just going to, everybody can taste from the fruit. And, and say the brachot, and we have new fruit, so you can say shichiano. And right after we continue with all the brachot, we're going to talk a little bit more about the auspicious time and Chag Shavuot. You know, it says that the sachar of the person who answers to the bracha is greater than the person who actually says the bracha. So it's very important to be, to be focused and listen to the bracha, and answer because if you just say amen because you just heard or you didn't listen it's called amen yatoma it's like you just said uh, hi no there's no power to it and Chachmei Kabbalah teach us that when a person says amen if you look at the numerical value of the word amen is 91 Nagimatria and it's the same numerical value of the word malach but specifically, Amen is 91, and the word Malach, angel, is also 91. And when a person listens to a bracha, what is Amen? Is the acronym of Kel Melech Neeman, which means that what you say, I agree with you, I affirm. So when you listen to the bracha and you internalize what your fellow friend said and you answer with all your heart, Amen, on that sport you, cr you create a Malach, you create an angel. So just by sitting sometimes in a shul and answering a hundred amens, you create an army of angels.
the Zohar explains that if a person doesn't have Kavanah in his Bracha, not only that he was like talking about like nonsense, it does the opposite effect. The person has to have the meaning, the Kavanah is actually thinking what he's about to say. The person has to hold in his hand what he's about to eat, concentrate and say, okay, I'm now going to eat this piece of fruit and to kind of take a two, three second meditation, what is actually happening, that in this food, there's what's called a nitzotz eloki, a godly spark, that came from a very high world. We know that before this world was created, there were two worlds, two spiritual worlds. Olam tohu, the world of tohu, which is all separated. Everything is separated. And olam tikkun, the word of fixing, which is all one. Tikkun comes from the word hitkalelut, everything is one. Oneness. Hashem Echad. Everything that comes from Olam Tikkun came to fix the Olam Tohu. Everything that originates from Olam Tohu manifests down to this world that is what's called in a chiluk. Everything that is not kosher, not pure, not permissible comes from Olam Tohu. One day we can do a shiur Kabbalah about explaining that. Wow. Yes. But the 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 Chachmei Kabbalah teach us that everything has a godly spark. Everything that manifests from Olam Tohu manifested down into this world, into animals, into vegetation, and into inanimates. In the Nevoah of Nevi Chizkel, he says that he saw in the chair of glory four faces. A face of a man, a face of an eagle, a face of a lion, and a face of an ox. The face of the man, it manifests into Adam, to human. The face of the ox manifests down to this world to all the behemot, all the animals that are under the category of behemah, which is ox, uh, cows, there's behemah daka, behemah daka, sheep, goats, etc. All the animals that manifests from pnei, Ha'ariyeh, from the face of the line, is all the regular, all the rest of the animals. All the animals that manifest from the Pnei Ha'nesher, from the face of the eagle, is all the birds, which includes also chickens and ducks, and they're all under the same thing, or fought. And af, under this Kisei kavod, there are type of angels that are called Ofanim. You read it in Kriyat Shema, Ofanim, Vechayot HaKodesh. Ofanim is a very high type of angel. When people ask if they're uh, uh, aliens in this world, these are the Ofanim. Whoever sees aliens, it's not aliens from Mars and from other galaxies, rather it's those angels. Ofan in Hebrew is a Galgal, is something round. That's why the aliens, you see them, the flying sources are round. We can do another shiur just on that. But these Ofanim, these very great Malachim, <coughs> Every creature, even a spiritual creature, so much more so a physical creature, has waste. You eat, then comes waste. Also the Malachim have waste. The waste of these Ofanim is all the vegetation in this world. To make a long story short, everything manifests from a spiritual world down to this world. And we as human beings have the power to take the inanimate, to take the vegetation, and to take the animals and release the godly spark that is in it, that came down from this Olam Tohu, release it out and elevate it back to its source, but to a greater world, Olam Tikkun, because I already fixed it, and from there I'm able to elevate it to a higher level, what's called Or and Sof, Atzmut and Sof, the, a, a very great and high level of godly revelation. So when I eat, if I just eat it because I'm hungry, then I didn't do anything. And if my eating has no meaning, but if I actually said the bracha, the bracha, I actually release the godly spark. And when I eat it, if I then take my energy and I pray, and I do mitzvot, and I learn Torah, then I have an elevator to elevate that spark up. And if I don't, then the spark stay down, and I'm compared to an animal that just eats, and nothing comes out of it. 
So when one says a bracha, he has to meditate. What am I doing here? I'm here uh, a messenger, an emissary of Hashem to help bring back all these godly sparks up to Hashem. So when I became religious, it was hard for me to observe all the mitzvot. So I said, it's easy for me to say brachot when I eat because it takes three seconds to say a bracha before I eat and seven seconds to say the after bracha. So I would concentrate on saying my brachot. And if a person will meditate and concentrate all day long to put his mind and focus on the brachot when he eats and the importance behind it, then you great, get great value from your day. Because in our busy schedule, it's hard to learn how to pray, how to do many things. But you can take five seconds to meditate what's going to happen now before I bite this apple. And with that, you reach to very high levels because you become a partner in the creation. And you don't compare yourself shalom, to an animal that just eats because it's, it's nature to eat. So going back to our topic, we talked about the holy shalah that instated this great bracha. So whoever didn't read it yet can still read it. You can read it at night, you can read it at day. Erev Rosh Chodesh Sivan is an auspicious time, meaning that a 90% sale. You say it on Rosh Chodesh Sivan, there's 80% sale. You say it on Shabbat, will be 70% and so forth. But you want to tap into the auspicious time. And this is where I want to talk a little bit about Rosh Chodesh and Shavuot. Because the world was created with time. When Hashem wanted to create the world, He had to create two elements. Place and time. Zman ve makom. And in order to create the world, He had to create first the space where to put the world. And then He had to create time. That was, that's why we see that in the six days of creation, it's defined by time. Yom Rishon, Yom Sheni. And every second of the creation, there's a different godly power that comes down to this world, what's called a hamshacha, a godly revelation. Sometimes it's more begilui, more revealed. Sometimes it's less begilui. And sometimes when it's more begilui, this hamshacha, this godly power is very revealed, that's an auspicious time. So what's an auspicious time? Shabbat. Because we know on Shabbat, the revelation, the godly revelation, is much more powerful than during the week. So we see that on Shabbat, we have to segregate ourselves from mundane things. That's why we're not allowed to work. That's why we're not allowed to do so many melachot. Because the world is being elevated to a different realm. And it's not shayach. It's not, it's, it's, uh, um, uh, it's not, uh, there's no connection now to the world. But Shabbat comes every week, so we kind of uh, get, re- get used to this auspicious time. But during the, the entire year, there are three festivals that are considered very auspicious time, which is Pesach, Shavuot, and uh, Sukkot. Then we have Rosh Hashanah, we have Yom Kippur. And then we have two special holidays that, are, that the rabbis instated, Purim and Hanukkah. And one of the reasons why it was instated as a holiday not only because there was a miracle. Yeah, one can say, why do you celebrate Purim? Why do you celebrate Hanukkah? Because 2,000 years ago was a miracle. Yeah, but if you look in the history of the Jews, there's thousands of miracles. Why don't, why don't we celebrate other miracles and we celebrate the miracle of Purim? Do you know that when Yeshua went to conquer Eretz Israel, he was in one of the wars, and the sun started going down, and he said, I need a few more hours to win this war, and if I'm not going to have sunlight, I'm going to lose the war. And there was a greatness that the sun stayed where it is. It didn't go down. Why don't we celebrate that day? It was a greatness. And he won the war. And he was able to go into Eretz Israel. And if you look into the Tanakh, you'll find hundreds if not thousands of miracles. Why don't we celebrate those miracles? Why do we celebrate just Hanukkah and just Purim? The reason why we celebrated besides the great miracle that was then... On these specific days, there's a great godly revelation, He'ara Elokit, this godly revelation that is very accessible. It's very easy to grab and to, to, to tap into it. That's why our sages say, this is such an auspicious time, let's tap into it. Let's instate it a special day. 
Because if I'm now going to say every Wednesday, every third Wednesday of the month is an auspicious time, if we wouldn't instate a special day for it, nobody will pay attention. It will pass like a regular day. But when our sages instated a day and say, oh, this is a special day, it's for us to say, oh, it's a hug, it's a holiday, let's get together, let's do something, let's meditate on the day, and so forth. So our sages instated that Purim and Hanukkah are special holidays because of this godly revelation, the suspicious time that happens this time of the year. Same thing with the festivals. But more than that, we have 12 times a year that we are blessed with the special day of Rosh Chodesh that our sages call Rosh Chodesh a Moed, a festival. They call it a Moed Katan, it's a mini festival, but it's a festival. So Rosh Chodesh is such an auspicious time that if you look at all the prayers that we're saying on Rosh Chodesh, you just, by reading the prayers, you understand the power of this day. The day of atonement, the day of forgiveness, the day of achievement. Such a great day. To a point that we, are, we have to minimize mundane things on this day and cherish this day to, 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 to great levels. Now, I have a whole lecture online, you should go and look at it, about the, the, the connection of Rosh Chodesh, women, Tehillim and David the Melech. It's a very special lecture, it's only half an hour, 35 minutes. Very interesting, I don't want to repeat it, but it's basically saying how special this particular day, Rosh Chodesh, is for women, Dafka. And one of the reasons is, because at the time of the golden calf, when the Bnei Israel were in the desert, and they sinned with the golden calf, so we know that they gathered around and they took all the jewelry and made the, the, the Egel Azav, the women didn't want to participate. And because they didn't want to participate, they merited that this festival is going to be for their schut. I think I mentioned it in one of the previous classes, that each one of our forefathers merited to have in his schut one of the festivals. Avraham Avinu got the festival of Pesach. For many different reasons. One of the reasons, if you remember in Parashat, by Ishlach, in Vayra, when the angels came to tell Avraham Avinu about Sarah, that she's going to have a son and to heal him from the circumcision, it was Pesach. And he told Sarah, go to the tent, make matzot. It, we know that a, a year later, Yitzchak was born on Pesach. There's many other reasons, but it, Avraham got the zchut that the festival of Pesach is his. Yaakov got the festival of Shavuot. Because you know that Yaakov was sacrificed, he was supposed to be on the sacrifice, then Avraham Avinu saw the ram, took the ram, cut the horn, and this is one of the horns is kept for Mashiach. When Mashiach will come, they're going to hitaka b'shofar gadol. And on the... It's hot. Let's see that the wine is strong. I'm... I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> I shouldn't drink wine before a shiur. <laughs> so Yitzchak was, the, the, was supposed to be sacrificed. So you know the whole story. So Yitzchak got the zchut of Chag Shavuot. Because it says that in Matan Torah, there was the kolot of the shofarot. There was the sounds of the shofar blown. We don't, we don't blow the shofar on Shavuot. But, so Yitzchak got the zchut of Shavuot. And Yaakov, when he came back from Haran, he made sukkot to his cattle, and to his sheep, and to his herds. So therefore he has the schut of the festival of Sukkot. But since the women didn't want to participate in the Chet Egel, they got the merit that Rosh Chodesh is their holiday. That's why many women, they take on themselves not to do any melachot on these days, to, to, to make it a very special day for them. You should go look at that class because it's very interesting, the connection between the Rosh Chodesh and the women and Dafka Tilim and David HaMelech. So Rosh Chodesh is a very special time. It's a time that it's in such an auspicious time that one needs to meditate and concentrate on this day. It's 24 hours a day that one can reach atonement, one can reach uh, Mechila and Kapara and it's done with praying and it's done with many other things. 
One of the things that we do on Rosh Chodesh that is very, very special is we do a Sudat Rosh Chodesh. Now, there are two meals that even the Shulchan Aruch gave them a whole different siman, and they cherished these two meals as very, very powerful meals, two Sudot. One of them is Melave Malka, which is considered an amazing, amazing time with great sgulot, re great remedies. If you don't eat that meal, I, I definitely recommend not to miss it even once. The meal of Melave Malka. And you make a nice meal of it, and a lot of people say, okay, I'll eat a little bit of crackers or whatever. You have to make it a special meal, washing for bread. The point is to, to make it a very special meal, to take a very unique dish that you like the most and make this dish just from Melave Malka and to make it a very special meal. Maybe we can do one shul just about Melave Malka because if you would really know the, the, the mysteries and the mysticism behind it, one would not want to miss it. It actually in some places say in a very extreme way that only whoever celebrates the meal of Melave Malka will merit to be part of the Geula because this is a Sudat Mashiach, David Mashiach, the, excuse me, the, the Sudat of David HaMelech, Malka Meshicha. And the other meal is Sudat Rosh Chodesh. And these are two auspicious meals that have great, great, great powers. And we even see in a very special way that Again, going back to the shiur that I said you, that is online, you should go and see the connection between David the Melech and Rosh Chodesh. But it, 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 there's many different hints. One of the hints, the connection between David the Melech and Rosh Chodesh, that the gematria, the numerical value of the word Rosh Chodesh is exactly the same numerical value of the word David Melech Israel Chai Vekayam. It's the same numerical value. Rosh Chodesh, David, Melech, Ezel, Chai, Vekayam. We know that David the Melech is connected to Mashiach. Mashiach is going to come from Bet David. Another hint of how great the Sudat of Rosh Chodesh is, is that the gematria of the sentence Sudat Yom Rosh Chodesh is the same numerical value, the same gematria of Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, eh, 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 David, Yosef, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, Moshe, Yosef, and David. The, the numerical value, the Oshpizin, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, David, and Yosef. Again, the same numerical value, Seudat, Yom Rosh Chodesh, is the same numerical value of the Shiva Roim. We're not going to go in too much into it, but the, the power of the seuda of Yom Rosh Chodesh, not tonight, during the day, you make a beautiful seuda, you gather your family, and you wash for bread, and you make a special meal, just by sitting in the meal, the, the, the power that one can get, just by eating the meal, no, no brachot, no praying, no nothing, just the power of sitting in the Sudat Rosh Chodesh. If one would know what a kapara, what a torment one gets on, Yom, on Rosh Chodesh from the Seuda, what, what mechila, what slicha, a torment, forgiveness, everything is on Rosh Chodesh. Just open the Sidur and read the brachot in the Musaf of Yom Chodesh, you understand what you can achieve on that day. And one of the things is by doing the Suda of Rosh Chodesh. Now the Suda is done during the day or? During the day. Suda Yom Rosh Chodesh. Not tonight. You do it Yom. Of course, if you want to Lam Shichit Akdusha, if you want to continue, then you do it before Shkia, before sundown, and then you let it go to the, to the evening and you, you get a greater revelation. The point is that why we need to meditate on such a, on such a, a special day is exactly what I said before, that there are certain times of the year that the godly revelation is very easy to access. Now, imagine Lehavdi Why is that? Why is that? Why is it that it's in cycles? Why is it every year the same things 
happen? Why is it that there's certain things that what what's like what's the godly revelation of what's different like when you said you were sure the sun stopped for it? So that's a godly revelation. Not great enough to celebrate it every year. So I'll tell I'll tell you what I I'll I will i will give you an example. The word holiday in Hebrew is Chag. Chag comes from the word Mechoga. Now, I don't know how to translate the word Mechoga in English, but, you know, architects have, you know, it's a very old tool that it has two pieces of metal. One has a pin, one has a pencil, and you turn it around and it makes a perfect circle. Maybe one of you can look quickly on, uh, online how uh, to translate the word mechoga. I don't know how to... Good. Mechoga... Mechog also is a... Uh, how do you say mechog on the, on the watch? You have... How do you call the two uh, arrows on a clock? Mechogim. The... How do you call it in English? The ones on the clock. Not a digital clock. On a regular clock. Hands. Hands? hands? Yes. That's mechogim. Okay. Anything that makes a perfect circle? Compass. Compass is a... Compass it? No, compass is a matzpen. Anyways, I don't know the word. I'll look, at, uh, I'll look at it for it later. But mechoga, when we were kids, I know architects use it or whatever. It's a, two pieces of metal connected to each other. One has a needle that you stick on the paper. One has a piece of uh, lead. So like a pencil, you turn it around, makes a perfect circle. That's mechoga. Anything that makes a perfect circle and starts at one point and finishes at the same point is called mechoga. That's why the, the hands of the clock is called mechogim, because they constantly do the same thing. That's why the chagim called chag, because it makes a circle. Every year comes, and it comes on the exact same day. This is the concept of chag. Chag is a festival. Our sages call the festivals Shavuot, Pesach, and Sukkot festivals. But they also call Rosh Chodesh a, 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 a festival. Because it repeats itself. It's constantly coming back. Same thing with the word year in Hebrew is Shana. Why is it called Shana? Because Shone, it comes back all the time. From Leshanin. It makes a, 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 a repetition. Shinui? No. Leshanen is not Shinui. Shinui is a uh, difference. Or how do you how do you translate Shinui? Leshanen is to repeat. Shinui is a change. Excuse me. Shinui. Shall we drosh gamal Shinui? But the point is that there are special days in the year, in the cycle of the year that the godly revelation is empowered. If you want to compare it to the physical realm, it's like an eclipse. Once a year, the sun is positioned in the same place. Well, I don't know once a year, maybe once in uh, whatever, how many years, the sun and the moon are positioned in the same place. Because there's a cycle, they turn around, and every such and such years and days, the sun and the, and the moon meet. The eclipse. the eclipse. Why did Hashem create it like that? One of the reasons is because everything in this world that Hashem created in the physical realm manifests from the spiritual realm. In the first spiritual realm, there's a concept, a concept in Kabbalah that it's called Na'ut Stofan Betchilatan. Everything is circles. In Kabbalah, everything is Igulim. Exactly. No, I'm talking about Mashe Na'ut Stofan Betchilatan. It manifests down to this world. That's why you see all the planets around. Everything here is cycles. What does it mean that this godly revelation is, is, is more accessible? It's exactly the same idea what I said before, that once a year there's a holiday, then they come out with a sale. To give a different example is, every four years there's a presidential campaign. During those four years, if you would want to talk to the president, you have zero chance to talk to the president. Only if you are a governor, or a senator, or a relative, or whatever, maybe you'll get the chance after many days, or weeks, or months that you're waiting, you'll get a, a personal meeting with the president. It's impossible. Who can meet the president? But once every four years, there's a presidential election, 
Suddenly you see him in the street, shaking everybody's hands. You can see him face to face, you can talk to him. Why? Because for him it's an auspicious time that he can come, show his face to the public, smile, so he will convince you to elect him. But this is the time where he makes himself accessible. What's so special about this time? Because he wants you to vote for him. Now this is a very lame physical example. But in the spiritual realm, there are times that Hashem wants to be very accessible to you. I can't hear you. Hashem is before you always. The way you present yourself at all times is important. How you sit, how you act, how you dress, Correct. how you are praying. At every moment, because God is present at every moment. Mm -hmm. But now you're saying there are suspicious times when God that is When He's present. more accessible. Doesn't mean that He's not present. He's always it's present. Accessible at that time. Like your I'll give you an example. Imagine now a big firm. You have the CEO the president and you have thousands of workers the CEO walks between the floors he walks around nobody can come approach him and talk to him you see him you know he's on the top floor you know he's there you you know there's cameras on all the cubicles that you you have to sit like this because you know cameras are looking at you but you don't see him you don't talk to you once a month he comes down to the departments he goes to the workers church shakes their hands talk to them how's the food how's the How's the, the, the conditions? I'll give you an example. When I was in the army, there's a platoon, then there's a brigade, then there's a, a division, there's, you know, there's hierarchy. So we know that there's a, 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 a commander on, on top of all the hierarchy. We never see him. We don't know who he is. Yeah, we know who he is. We never see him. We, we, we would even think to dare to talk to him. And I know that if Chas Shalom I do something wrong, they take me to court martial in this commander. Once in a blue moon, you know, I see him. And when I see this commander, who you have to stand like, you know, you can't move. But once every blue moon, this commander walks in between all the soldiers. Chayal, soldier, how are you? What's your name? Where are you from? How's the food? How's your clothes? How are you sleeping? You feeling okay? So this is, again, these are bad examples because you can't compare anything in the physical realm to the spiritual realm. But the reality is that Hashem is constantly present. That's why, exactly what I said last week, accessible. accessible means that you can just, you can always turn to Hashem and talk to Him. But, and Hashem is always present, He's around you. But there are auspicious times that Hashem tells you, now you have my undivided attention. Now is the time that I'm, you know, Hashem dresses Himself in many different garments. Sometimes He's dressing Himself in the garment of judgment, of din. You gotta be, you gotta stay away. Sometimes Hashem dresses Himself in the garment of chesed, of kindness, of mercy. That's the time when you approach Him. Sometimes Hashem dresses Himself in the garment of hod, of netzach. Hashem has different garments, how He governs the worlds. So we know, for example, between Rosh Chodesh Elul, the beginning of Elul, till Yom Kippur, it's a very auspicious time where Hashem is dressed only in the garment of Chesed. It's 40 days that you can approach Hashem and your request is going to be answered much faster and much easier. Hashem doesn't make Himself accessible all day long. Why is that? That's a whole different concept by Himself. He still is, you know, as much as He loves us, He's still our God and He's still our King. It has to be some type of a hierarchy. We can't just turn to our King and say, Hey, how are you doing today? It doesn't work like that. There's a way to approach the King. But sometimes there's a Independence Day or a Veteran Day, there's a sale. Hashem says, Today I'm taking off my garment of judgment. Just come and talk to me. Yeah? I mean, it doesn't mean that the, the, the accessibility, if I'm using the right word, is at the same level. But it's there. Of course it's there. Hashem is always there. It's Hashem, any second, any second that you want to call Hashem, Hashem will, will, will listen. But some special days, Hashem is more accessible to your prayers, and the time, your prayers will be get answered much easier. I'll give you a different example. How 
How do you know that people's prayers don't get answered? How do you know that they do? Because all the prayers get up to Hashem. It's maybe not what a person needs to get. Sometimes a person can... No. But, I, I, but I, my child can come to me and pray for me to buy him a gun. Please, please buy me a gun. I heard the prayer and my answer is no, it's not good for you. So I gave a very extreme example, but my child can come and ask for something. He prays, all day long he prays. He doesn't pray from a sidhu, he just calls my pants and pulls it like this. And he says, please, please, I'll be such a good boy, just buy me this. I hear the prayer, I just didn't, not that I didn't accept it, I just know. I don't want to give you this, I want to give you that. That's the problem with many people, they pray for the wrong thing. So they say, oh, Hashem didn't give me my prayer. Now, to get off subject with the whole concept of the prayer, and I don't want to really get off the subject, I kind of want to do the class, and, la and later on we'll do more questions. But the Zohar explains that there's many chambers in Shamaim, and when I pray, my prayers go up. We did a, sh a class about prayer three weeks ago. My prayer goes up to the first chamber. There's a whole heavenly court there, a whole Beidin sitting there. They take the prayer and they analyze it. Should we elevate it to the next level or should we leave it here? Is it good enough? Did you really concentrate on the prayer? Do you really want it? Do you really mean it? Do you have enough schuyot, have enough merits? Maybe let's, they judge it. If you're worthy, the prayer goes up another chamber and another chamber and another chamber. Before it comes up to Hashem, there's many chambers where it has to go through. That's why our prayers have to be clean, they have to be honest, they have to, a person has to prepare himself before he, before he prays. Women is a little bit different, but a man has to go in the, in the morning to the mikveh, has to bring himself a, 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 an extension of Kedusha, had to get, remove all this negative energy from him, then a person has to, a man has to learn a little bit before he prays, has to do what's called hachana, preparation. He says, likanes el kodesh you have to make a preparation. So, the more you prepare for the prayer, your prayer is more honest, the more sincere. Most people, when they pray, you know, there's too many thoughts going on, they're not really concentrating, half the people t texting on the phone. It's not, that's not a prayer. So, the thing is that all our prayers come to Hashem. Whether Hashem wants to give it to you or not, that's His, his decision. Maybe sometimes Hashem doesn't want to give a person what he's praying for because he's not, he's not worthy for it, or he's not supposed to get it, or it's bad for him. A person can now pray for something, and it's not the, not the right time. I gave the example, I think, last time when we did the show with the prayer, that we met here a few weeks ago, a friend of my wife, that when we lived in New York, she was this girl that never got married. All the weddings, she was sitting by herself. All the Shabbat tables, she was by herself. She was the girl who never got married and everybody was praying for her and mentioning her names. For years she never got married. Now, two months ago, we finally met her husband and we were like, oh, Baruch Hashem, after maybe t 10 years, she finally got married. And we now figured out why she didn't get married. Because her husband only became a Baal Tshuva two years ago. So she became Baal Tshuva 10 years ago. She was ready, her husband wasn't ready. Her husband was wandering in the world. Two years ago, he became Baal Tshuva. Then, she got him. And when she went to Shadchanim, she said, I want a, a, a husband, a God-fearing husband. She said, I want him to have a beard. I want him to learn Torah. I want him to be praying three times a day. So they couldn't find the husband because the husband at the same time was in discotheques. <laughs> so, when you're looking at it from this angle, she can say, my prayers weren't answered. Hashem says, oh, oh they were answered. Just the other side wasn't ready yet. So sit and wait. So uh, Hashem always hears our prayers, and if they don't get answered how we want them to, it doesn't mean that Hashem didn't answer them. It just means that we're not worthy of getting it, or we're not supposed to get it. Maybe it's not the time for me to have no parnasa. Maybe it's not the time for me now to get married. I don't know. Hashem knows. Hashem knows what's good for me. We're, we're not going to do a shiur now about praying, and I want to go through the shiur. But going back to what I was saying... There are auspicious times in the year where Hashem is more accessible to you. He's more easy to be turned to. He's more willing to be forgi for forgiveness. Like I said before, between Rosh Chodesh, the head of the month of Elul, till Yom Kippur, there's 40 days that the 13 attributes of mercy are shining what's called Behit Gabrut. And it's an auspicious time 
to, to, to reach, to tap into the garment of Rachamim, of mercy of Hashem. So it's the time to do tshuva and to repent and to, to, to change things. It's not the right time. If you look from Rosh Chodesh Av, from the beginning of the month of Av, till Yud Be'Av, it's a very bad time for, for, for Rachamim. It's a time that the Midat Adin, the garment of Din, of judgment is Behit Gabrut. You don't want to even think of praying to Hashem. That's why you minimize everything you, we don't. That's why we don't eat meat and we don't celebrate. We don't want to even show any... Excuse me? From Rosh Chodesh Av to... There's three weeks from Yudzayin Tammuz till Tisha B'Av. These are three weeks that are also very, n n you know, I don't like using the wrong words, but it's not an auspicious time to pray to Hashem. It's an auspicious time to hide. Why? Because this time of the year, the judgment, the Midat al Din, Hashem is dressed in this garment of judgment for whatever reason. And it's not the right time to do anything festivity, f festive. Now, why do we minimize our behavior? Why do we don't do parties? Why do we don't listen to music? We don't do uh, big uh, uh, we, uh, parties for engagements and stuff like that? Because we don't want the Satan, we don't want the, 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 the prosecutor coming to Shemayim and saying, Oh, this is a very bad time now and they're finding the time now to celebrate? And you just bring on yourself more judgments. So we know these times of the years, of the year, that are more auspicious to judgment. Sometimes they're more auspicious to mercy. So at the time from Rosh Chodesh Elul till the Rosh Chodesh, till Yom Kippur, is a very auspicious time for mercy. That's when it's time to do tshuva. So why it happens, it's that's, what, that's the will of Hashem. We can do another shiur just of the reason, reasons why Hashem does it. In a very short way, why Hashem does it? Because He wants to give you times. First of all, Hashem, I'm going to talk in a second about two specific things of that you have to concentrate on Chag Shavuot and it will kind of answer this, uh, this uh, thing. You know what, I'm actually going to say it now because it will just answer your question. The main thing we celebrate on Chag Shavuot of the, of the, on this holiday is that we receive the Torah. Chag Matan Torah it's called. The day that we got the Torah. It's called also Chag Shavuot for, you know, we're finishing the seven weeks of the Omer. There's many reasons why it's called Shavuot. But in essence, this is called Chag Matan Torah. Even in the prayer, we don't say Chag Shavuot. We said Chag Matan Torah Teno. So this is the day that we celebrate the time that we got the Torah. So the entire holiday is around the point that Hashem gave us the Torah. So, Hashem gave us the Ten Commandments on that holiday, on this suspicious day. And the first commandment is, I am the God, your God, who took you out of Egypt. Here comes a very big question. If, you, if, if this is such a great thing, that the first uh, commandment, it's considered, you know, our sages, sages teach us that the importance goes by the first, and then as they go lower, the less importance on the commandment. We mentioned last week about the comparison between murder and Shabbat. Because in this world, if you're going to tell any person, go and murder that person, they'll be like, Chas v'shalom, I will never dare to murder anyone. This is in our eyes considered one of the worst things. But if you look in the hierarchy of the Dibrot, this not, not irzach, don't murder is number six. And keep Shabbat is number four. So in the hierarchy, Shabbat is much more important than murder. So if we look at it, that to murder somebody in this world is the worst thing, but most people say, Shabbat, ah, Shabbat, well, who cares? It's not an important thing. So if the first Dibra, the first commandment, is supposedly be the most important, why is Hashem mentioning that He took us out of Egypt? Say, I am Hashem who created the world. In essence, it seems like a much greater thing than taking me out of Egypt. Why does Hashem say in the first commandment, I took you out of Egypt? Say something great, like creating the world. Then the second Dibra says, you should not have another God besides me. Here is already bringing something negative. Whoa, why are you bringing a negative entity into this 
conversation right now? You bringing the option of sinning? That is another thing that doesn't really make sense. You should say, you should only serve me. Why are you saying you should not have another God? You, know, you, you have to follow the words, how the, how the, the wording is. So the thing is that we know what really happened on Matan Torah is that Hashem gave us the power to serve Him according to our power. Before Matan Torah, nobody served Hashem. Nobody kept the mitzvot besides our forefathers. Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, they kept the entire Torah, but they kept it in such a high level, they didn't do the physical mitzvot, they didn't put filin. They did it in a spiritual level. So they were able to keep the entire Torah in a spiritual realm. Then came very few individuals in history that they also kept the entire Torah, but they didn't do it with anything physical. At the time of Matan Torah, the decree was annulled. Up until Matan Torah, there was a decree Hashamayim Shamayim Lashem Va'aretz Natan Livnei Adam. The heavens, the Torah, the mitzvot is for the Elyonim, for the Supreme, for the Abrav. And everything in this world, in this earth, is for human beings. But during Matan Torah, the decree was changed that Tachtonim Alula Elyonim, the lower realm went up to the spiritual realm, and the Elyonim Erdulot Tachtonim. And the spiritual realm world came down to the physical realm. We see that Moshe Rabbeinu represents the lower realm. He went up to the mountain. And the spiritual realm, Hashem, went down on the mountain. There was a chibur, there was a connection between the spiritual and the physical. Ammatil Matan Torah, there was no connection between the spiritual and the physical. So there were very few mitzvot that we got before Matan Torah. We got to be fruitful and multiply. Purvu. We got the mitzvah of circumcision. Before we left Egypt, Hashem gave us a few more mitzvot doing the, 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 the blood of the milah, the, the blood of the circumcision, and doing the Korban Pesach. He had to give us a few mitzvot because we didn't have mitzvot. But we only got all the mitzvot in Matan Torah. So when our forefathers did the mitzvot, they did the, the same act in the spiritual realm. So in Matan Torah, Hashem decided that the decree will be annulled, and now the spiritual and the physical will be merged together. And that's why he gave us all the physical mitzvot, so we can merge the spiritual, spiritual with the physical. But what really happened, that up until Matan Torah, whoever wanted to serve Hashem, did it how Hashem wanted, with the power of Hashem. From Matan Torah, Hashem said, now I'm going to give you free will, I'm going to give you Bechira Chofshit, and you're going to serve me from this day on with your power. Not with my power, with your power. Meaning that it gives in space and room for a person to fail. What does it mean that we serving Hashem according to our power? Hashem tells you to do a mitzvah, or Hashem tells you to not to do a sin. You come to the crossroad, should I do it, should I not do it? If comes a mitzvah in your way and you did it, then you did the will of Hashem and you, you won this point right now. And if you didn't, you fail. You fail the, the mitzvah. Excuse me? Uh, ultimately everything is the will of Hashem. The thing is that the reason why the second mitzvah and not the first one was said in such a way is to give us the option that we have to serve Hashem with our power. We have our own free will to do it. It wouldn't be fair if Hashem would do it for us. Meaning that we have to have our own power to do it. You mentioned before with the Parchanish Matam, it says that for every time Hashem spoke, their soul left the, their body. So the Gemara explains that at the first commandment, Hashem said, Anuchi, and all their souls went out of their body, they died. And then how did he got them alive again? He brought down this dew, that same dew that we'll have in Tchiat HaMetim, and that's how he resurrected them. He got them alive again. And then in the second Dibra, again they died. And so for every Dibra, Parcha Nishmatam. In the first Dibra, it's talking about Ani Hashem Elokech Asher Mitzrayim. 
Why is that the most important commandment? Because it's very easy to do something that is a habit. If you were now born and you have a habit, it's very easy to continue doing the habit. But it's the hardest thing to break the habit. And this is where Hashem says, I want you to serve me in your level. Because I want you to break your habit. Not me breaking your habit. That's the concept of why the second commandment was given to us in, in a negative form. You should not have other. Because Hashem wanted to pull, give us this space that we can fail. A, that we can do tshuva. But more than that, that we, we have the right the right self-choice if to do it or not to do it. And if Hashem would not do that, we would do it according to our, you know, we would serve Hashem with His power. More than that, the reason why it's said in such a way is that Hashem says to do something, you know, that is your habit, it's a very easy thing, but I want you to break your habits. And at the time that Hashem says that, Ani Hashem Elokech Mitzrayim, what is it going to do with the habits? If Hashem would say in the first commandment, I am your God that created the world, you know, we all know that, we all know that you created the world. We know it's a great miracle. But you know what's the greater miracle in the Yetziat Mitzrayim? That Hashem changed the nature of the world. In creating the world, it's an action that is called from Yesh Ein, Something from nothing. Hashem took nothing and He created something. Yes, it is a great miracle. But it's for Hashem, it's like for us, you know, peeling an apple. For Hashem to create something is nothing. So for, him, for us it's a great thing. For Hashem is nothing to create the world. So for Him it's like another day, no, I'll create a world. So it's not a great miracle in Hashem's eyes. But to change the nature of this world, that's a great miracle. So because before that, the nature, there was no nature of the world, so because... No, there was. So then creating... Because now creating nothing, something from nothing is in its nature. No, creating something from nothing for us is a great miracle. For Hashem it's nothing. But it's not nature. No, you're missing the point. For Hashem to create something from nothing is, is not a big th deal for Him. We look at it as a great but miracle. But once the created is, is made, Hashem created the world with rules. And nobody breaks the rules including Him. That's why all the miracles, they must get dressed in nature. There's no such a thing, Hashem does not break the rules of the world. He created the world, there's rules, and they're not meant to be broken. They can be bent a little bit, but that's it. Hashem will never break the rules. So any miracle that Hashem wants to bring down to this world, the miracle has to get dressed in nature. It cannot happen in a, in a way that is beyond nature. So if you look at all the... Exactly. If you look at all the miracles that happened at the time of leaving Egypt, they were all dressed in nature. Just that Hashem manipulated the seder, the order of nature. This is a greater miracle. Why? Because for Hashem to create the world is like for us having a habit. I have a habit to do such and such. For me to break the habit is, is a lot of work. So for Hashem to bend the rules, to break this habit, because it says, Hashem recreates the world every second. They didn't create the world 5,775 years ago and went out for coffee. Hashem recreates the world every second. And if one second Hashem backs out, the world doesn't exist anymore. Hashem constantly recreates the world. But for Him, it's a habit. He recreates the world every second. But to change the laws of nature, that's already breaking the habit. And the same thing with us. We have habits. We are born with habits. And most of them are bad. But for us to break our habit, that's a greater miracle. That's why the first commandment says, Ani Hashem Elokecha Mitzrayim. This is the commandment that gives us the power to break our habits. And this is the whole concept of this holiday. That we have an auspicious time to break our habits. To break our negative habits. Because we're all born with negative habits. And this is the main power of this holiday. 
We have 10 powers of this holiday because every commandment gives us a power that we can use in our, uh, our serving of Hashem. So the thing is that we can take from this holiday that every Dibra, every commandment gives us power to do something. So in this year we're going to concentrate that we can tap into this auspicious time, because again we have an auspicious time on Shavuot, that Hashem gives us the power that the same way that Hashem says, I bent my rules, I went out of my habit to get you out of Egypt, I'm giving you now the power that you can break your habits and you can go out of your Egypt. Because it says, our sages says, Every day a person has to see himself like as if today he went out of Egypt. Now Egypt in Hebrew is Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim comes from the word Meitzar. Meitzar is a limitation. We all have a limitation. Why our sages tell us that every day a person has to see himself like as if he went out of Egypt? Because today I got out of my limitation. I got up one level higher. Tomorrow I'm going to deal with another limitation and then I'm going to overpower it I'm overcome it and the following day I'm going to have another limitation to to work with the thing is that people think they, they get into despair that they have a Nisayon they have a, a test from Hashem they fight it they overcome it and then they say okay I hope tomorrow I'm done no once you finish your Nisayon tomorrow is a new one we're here to do to here to work that's why a lot of people, they fall in despair and they're saying, well, another one, another one. Again, I have to worry about my panasa. Again, I have to worry about getting married. Again, I have to worry about how I'm going to pay my mortgage. Yeah, you were created to wake up in the morning and say, okay, Hashem, what's my job for today? The fact that I have to go and work money, that's to pay the bills, but I have a job. So every day I have to wake up and say, okay, Hashem, what's my job today? And I have a job to overcome. I have a limitation, a mitzrayim to... To leave, to go out of my Mitzrayim, to break, exactly, to break my limitation and to break my habit. And this holiday is the auspicious time that gives you the power that the same way that Hashem got, broke his habit, you can break your habit. Exactly, exactly. So the power of Shavuot, the auspicious time of Shavuot, is to overpower our limitations. That's why Hashem says, I didn't say, he didn't say, I, I am your God that created the world. I'm the God who got you out of Egypt. The second commandment is that you're going to do it yourself. Don't come to me to tell me, take me out of my Mitzrayim. You do it yourself. Going back to your question, why the auspicious times, is that Hashem says, okay, every day of the week and the year, you do it yourself. <clears throat> Don't complain. You're Eved. Eved Hashem, you're a slave. You have to do it yourself. Once in a blue moon, I'll give you a discount. I'll shine on you. I'll do an auspicious time that you don't really have to work hard. During the year, if I want to have mechila, let's say a person right now did a schas v'shalom a sin. <gasps> what did they do? He catch, catch himself in the act. Right away, he wants to do tshuva. So the first thing that he does, he, he says, oh, I, I, did, I did something wrong. He confesses, oh my God, I did something wrong. He did tshuva. The second thing he says, okay, I, 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 he feels the charata. Then he has to pray for kapara, etc. During the year, it's going to be very hard for him to do tshuva. But if he does the tshuva on a saray, a tshuva, it's easy. It's going to be accepted much easier. The prayers will be heard much, hard, much faster. So Hashem gave us times of the year that are auspicious times, that you can tap into them, and the effect is much greater. And the closeness to Hashem is much easier, and that's when you can get it. And this is the time of Rosh Chodesh, and this is the time of Chag Shavuot. So what you need to take from this shiur is that tonight and tomorrow you have 24 hours to tap into it, and not to waste your time on nonsense, to concentrate, okay, I'm going to read Tilim now for an hour, and I'm going to pray for Hashem to, to bless me with, with healthy kids, and good kids, and they should have Midot Tovot, and they should be uh, disciplined, and I'm going to read, take another time to read and to learn and to do tshuva and to repent. Why? Because this is the day that the kapara, the repentance comes like that. In seconds. This is the day that Hashem says to them, I'm giving you a discount. Just, just, just ask. Now ask. Now the prayers are going to be answered much easier. And you make yourself a suda, a great meal. 
and you beautify the meal and you say, I'm going to make, no, I'm not going to make crackers and cheese or whatever. You make a beautiful meal. And don't worry about how much this meal is going to cost you because Hashem tells you on, the, on the, all the expenses of Rosh Chodesh, I'm, I'm covering. Don't worry about it. A lot of people say, ah, you know, I'm very tight with money. Don't worry. Go and buy steaks. Buy the best meal. And make this meal special because just the meal itself is a kapara. So you make yourself a great suda, a great meal on Rosh Chodesh. And if people go to a restaurant. If you go to a restaurant, yeah. Yeah, if you... It's, a, it's better than not doing anything at all. But... Every Rosh Chodesh. The, the, the power of Rosh Chodesh Sivan is because why is it called Rosh Chodesh and not Chilat HaChodesh? In Hebrew, Rosh is head, Chilat is the beginning. Technically, it should be called Chilat HaChodesh, not Rosh Chodesh. The difference with Rosh Chodesh with everything, that usually in Avodat Hashem, first you do, then you get. In Rosh Chodesh, you first get, then you do. Rosh Chodesh, you already get the reward, Lemafreya, and then you get the bracha for the entire month. On Shabbat, Misha Tarach Be'erev Shabbat, Yuchal Be'Shabbat. Whatever you did during the week, that's how your Shabbat is going to be. Rosh Chodesh, you first get the bracha, and then it affects you the entire month. So if you want a good month, you invest on Rosh Chodesh. Not during the month. A lot of people complain, oh, I had a bad month, I didn't make money, I, 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 I fought with my wife, whatever. It's because on Rosh Chodesh you didn't tap into that day, and that's the day that you can actually get all the bracha. That's why the Shabbat before Rosh Chodesh, we call it Shabbat Mevarchim, the Shabbat, excuse me, that blesses the month, because that's the Shabbat that affects the entire month. And the day of Rosh Chodesh, it's such an auspicious time for Hashem to accept your prayers, to listen to your prayers, to forgive all the things you need to be forgiven. And you do it by praying, you do it by reading, you do it by eating, you do it by lighting candles. You asked before, why Dafka Rosh Chodesh Sivan? Every Rosh Chodesh is an auspicious time. But Rosh Chodesh Sivan, every month, has a power. The month of Nisan, we know, comes from the word Nes, miracle, has power for miracles. The month of Iyar, the abbreviation of Iyar is Ani Hashem Rofecha. It's a month with auspicious time for healing. The month of Sivan, this is the month when you get all the Hashpa'ot from Hashem. The same way that we got the Torah, this is the Hashpa'ot, is influence, uh, an influence from Hashem, blessings from Hashem. It's a time when we get everything. There's, I explained in a previous shiur that there are two ways how Hashem gives you. One of them is called Hamshacha Milemala Lemata, a blessing from above to below. And one of them is Hamshacha Milemata Lemala, a blessing that comes from below to above. Below to above means that I have to do something. But the Hamshacha, the blessing from above to below, is that Hashem gives you. Here, in this month, Hashem gives you the Bracha from above. The same way the Torah came down from above to below. This is the month that Hashem tells you, this month, the Hamshacha is Milemala Lemata. You don't have to do much. On other months, yeah, you have to do a lot in order to bring down this Hamshacha. So this is an auspicious time that the same way that we got the Torah, every year we talked about the, the cycle. This is the time that every year this He'ara Elokit, this godly power that, comes, that came down to the world 3,300 years ago, the same He'ara Elokit is coming down on this day. So this is the time where you tap into it. This is the time when Hashem is behit gelut, behit gabrut. You have an auspicious time to tap into it. So you should take to consideration and, and, and take from this class that tonight and tomorrow is an auspicious time to get all your prayers answered and all your sins forgiven and everything wrong doing to get it reversed. To pray for your kids and then in six days, on Metzai Shabbat, it's Chag Shavuot, is the time where you can tap in to reach to this power that you're going to have it much easier to break your habits. To be able to bring down these miracles into this world. So I wish you great success. Excuse me? How do you pray for that? There's two ways to pray. One is from the book, how our sages gave us to pray, and the other one is from your heart. I can't hear you. The day itself is an auspicious time. That if you tap into the day, 
Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. Sunday night. Eh, no, Motzei Shabbat. Sunday, uh, Saturday night, Sunday day. The second day is a little bit less of the power. The thing is that the way it works with tapping in is that imagine Chas Shalom, a person is drowning and there's a helicopter above him with the rescue team. If he doesn't put his hand out, they can't pull him. All he needs to do is pull his hand out and they grab him and they pull him out. All you need to do is tap into the day. Hashem already will pull you. He will give you that. Tapping in is observing the holiday. Exactly how Hashem tells you to observe it. Meaning that it's like a Shabbat. You can't drive, you can't talk on the phone. You observe the holiday exactly like a festival. You do the surudot, you do the meals of the festival. You pray, you go to a shul, you open the siddur, you pray exactly. 